needs strategies to improve cancer management the south asia center for medical physics and cancer research has started a journey in 2018 with a mission to advance cancer care practice in bangladesh and other countries in south asia by disseminating scientific information fostering the educational and professional development and promoting the highest quality medical services for patients our center is a good example of south south cooperation in south asia region and it will also expand its activities in other developing countries especially in african continent until 2020 scmpcr arranged five iomp and ebamp accredited hands on workshop three in service training and two e learning program for the cancer care related personnel with qualified experts besides scmpcr organizes regularly awareness and screening programs it also publishes newsletter by annually to represent its activities and landscape of cancer care in this region i am very happy to inform you that the e learning program is combination with hands on workshop will continue even after pande- pandemic in 2021 we have planned three e learning courses in the month of february july and october each course consist a series of lectures by the international well known expert we start the first one today i hope that you will enjoy and learn a lot from this program last but not least i thank the organizing committee headed by the ceo of the sc mpcr Dr. Hasin Anupam Azari for the for her strong efforts to make this program a successful one. Wish you all a happy, peaceful, and COVID-free, healthy year 2021. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your for your valuable speech. If anyone have any questions or suggestion, please comment in the chat box. Today is the first lecture is on introduction of brachytherapy will be delivered by our honorable speaker Dr Frank William Hensley former medical physicist department of radiation oncology at University Hospital Heidelberg Germany he is one of the partner to develop medical physics in Bangladesh through collaboration Dr Hensley completed his diploma and PhD from University of Heidelberg He works at different hospital in SN Hemmer Heidelberg Germany. His main focus was on brachytherapy, intraoperative radiotherapy, total body and total skin radiotherapy and general radiotherapy. Also he served as a lecturer in Institute for Technology Heidelberg University Medical Physics European School of Medical courses in Santiago Gondo University Bangladesh. He has more than 67 publications in peer reviewed journals and membership of DEGRO DGMP DPG ESTRO ISIORT Now I am invite Dr Frank Hensley to deliver his talk on introduction of brachytherapy During the lecture please send any question in the chat box All of you are requested to mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the lecture. Dr. Hensley, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you. And I see you. Now floor already... is yours. Hmm? Yes, I see you've already made me presenter. Thank you okay. for the um for the introduction and I will pop up my slides here and let's see. <coughs> Should be coming. There we are. Yes. So, if, yeah. if you want to enlarge this, you can have a little bit more. I don't think you need to see me during the lecture. <clears throat> um All right. Um my topic today is uh introduction uh to to brachytherapy and what I want to speak about is uh brachytherapy basics and I also want to speak about source <clears throat> calibration today. and tomorrow i will be speaking about uh, dose calculation i spoke with renato walter so we 
we don't, don't have too much overlap on that. So these will be the things that you will be hearing from me. Um, <clears throat> in this presentation, I want to show you the basic differences of dose distributions in brachytherapy and external beam therapy. Um, I want to speak about the basic brachytherapy technology, what are the machines and, and the techniques like. I want to at least name the basic types of, of applications that are applied in brachytherapy. <clears throat> want to show the radionuclides used. Um, and then it comes uh, gets a little bit more physical. <clears throat> and I want to um, speak about the deposition of energy from a radiation source, from a brachytherapy source, <clears throat> and how you describe that with the air camera rate constant. And um, speak a little bit about selection criteria for a brachytherapy source, which can, which can you use, which can't you. <clears throat> and, um, and one of the basic um, take-home messages will be that you know how the strength of a brachytherapy source is characterized <clears throat> for dosimetry. And this is done with the air camera rate and not as you would um, maybe think by the activity. So let's get started. So first, first, I want to speak about the differences between dose distributions in brachytherapy and in external beam therapy. And the main difference I want to show you is the steep dose gradient. This, what you see here, is the situation in external beam therapy. And what you see here is the depth dose curve of six MV photons, like you would get them from an accelerator. <coughs> um, the depth dose curve as you would normally show it. Uh, we start off at a focus source distance of one meter, and then as as, as the as we travel into water, um, you see that you have a dose buildup, and then the dose starts to decrease and gives you the typical depth dose curve. So this is what you measure <coughs> when you set up a water phantom and measure the basic data for your accelerator. In the diagram here, you see a second red curve, and this red curve is the inverse square law. That is, that is the decrease that your dose or your radiation fluence uh, will have in any case simply by changing the difference, the distance, <clears throat> without any interaction with water at all. So this red curve here um, is produced when you, uh, it's produced alone by changing the distance and the difference between these two curves, that is absorption and scatter and what all happens in the water. So you see that a large part of this of this depth dose curve here is inverse square law. Now, if we change to brachytherapy, the difference is that we put our sources <coughs> into the tissue. So we have a very short distance. We get into the distance distances in the range of millimeters or centimeters. And what happens then is that our <coughs> um, inverse square law looks like this here. 1 over r square is a hyperbolic curve. That means going towards 0, towards um, the origin. This curve uh, tends towards um, 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 infinity. Um, that is, and that is the reason why we have a very steep 1 over r um, uh, decrease of dose uh, close to the sources. <coughs> and that, it's actually much more steep than the... Um, um, than the um, absorption of the, of the radiation by the tissue. And that is what we use in brachytherapy. And we use these, um, this steep uh, 1 over r squared uh, gradient <coughs> to produce small, conformal, compact dose distributions in the target <coughs> with, very, with low doses surrounding the tissues. With a so, so it's compact dose distributions with a steep dose gradient in all directions around the dose, um, uh, around the, 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 the primary dose distribution. Okay, and we call this brachytherapy. Okay, brachy comes, uh, is, from, is, is Greek for short, and what is meant is a short distance from the source to the target. <clears throat> this slide here now shows you a little bit more what the difference between the two dose distributions in brachytherapy and external beam therapy is. <coughs> what you see here, is um, a CT slice through the um, 
uh, through the lower skull, through the down here in the, in the skin area, you can see the uh, the, the lower jaw uh, uh, in here, and in here is the mobile tongue. This would be the um, the, the, the neck um, vertebrae, <coughs> and okay, this here is the tongue, and in this uh, in in the tongue we have. Um, performed a interstitial brachytherapy implant, and you see that with these white uh, metal artifacts here. <clears throat> they, come, they come from metal markers that are in the catheters that were put into this uh, implant, and they are used for dose planning. Um, these two CT slices are identical. Um, I just didn't get the the hounds the the uh, the presentation quite uh, quite identical, and in both I have um, defined a target volume. That's this fat red curve here. It's identical on both of these uh, slices, and for both of these slices, I have uh, produced dose. We've produced a dose distribution one time with on the left with with brachytherapy. Yeah, with brachytherapy, and on the right with external beam therapy. And what you see here is the dose distribution from a um, 3D conformal therapy, uh, which would not be quite the technique. I guess today you would, would preferably do this with uh, IMRT, but the basic differences are the same. So we have the same target on both of these. <clears throat> and now, uh, if we if we plan the dose distribution, you can see the. Um, the, uh, the dose distribution here on the isodose lines that are shown here. This is 100% for the external beam. This is, I guess, 90% or 80%. Um, and over here, this light blue line here is 100% is on the brachytherapy dose distribution. So what this shows is that we can get a very similar dose coverage with both brachytherapy and external beam therapy. The big difference I want to show you is this. In external, uh, external beam therapy, this here is the 50% isodose, like this, and this here is 30%. So that covers almost the, the complete uh, uh, um, transection of the, of the skull there. In brachytherapy, the 50% isodose is this line, the inner line, and the 30% line is the outer line. So you see that, especially here in this region of the um, paratoid, we get much less dose with brachytherapy. And that is why we use brachytherapy, because in certain situations, we want to avoid putting dose into these regions here. For instance, <clears throat> if this is a recurrence and the patient has already been treated and already has a lot of dose on, on his paratoids, uh, we will try to avoid that and uh, perform a therapy that um, that uh, puts as little dose to the paratoid as, as we can. So this is why we use brachytherapy. <clears throat> we don't use it in every patient. About 10% of the patients in Germany get brachytherapy. The rest all get external beam therapy with some kind of modality. <clears throat> but for 10% of the patients, we have a problem with external beam therapy. For instance, by having pre-irradiated areas like this, or by having tar uh, risk um, um, organs very close to the target, and things like that. And for these patients, we can use brachytherapy to um, to still give a dose, um, to still give a radiation therapy, even if uh, external beam therapy is difficult or even excluded for these patients. Another difference you can see here is that with external beam therapy, this is our 100% isodose, and I didn't show it on here, but you know from external beam therapy that you don't have much inhomogeneity. Um, the dose is very homo homogeneous uh, in here, so it's covered about with 100%, and we maybe have 105% or 115% somewhere in here, but it's only a small area. <clears throat> in brachytherapy, if you look over here, we have large areas of high dose. This here is um, 150%, and this here is even 180%, the little yellow line here. So close to the sources, again, because of the inverse square law, <coughs> we will have very high doses, what is called the hyperdose sleeve in brachytherapy. We can't avoid that, but we have to keep these, these high dose areas as small as possible so that... Um, 
so that they cause as little as, uh, as possible side effects. And this is something we have to keep in mind. And this is one of our planning objectives that we also have in brachytherapy to keep the hot uh, areas as small as possible. And there are also other differences in radiobiology. I won't speak about that. But <clears throat> the dose distributions are a bit, uh, uh, are not very easy to compare. Okay. We'll move on to uh, brachytherapy technology and the techniques with which it's applied. Uh, starting off with brachytherapy, what one did was what was called hot loading. One, in this one, manually uh, inserted radioactive sources <laughs> in shape of needles into the tissue. So you would have to stand next to the patient with your radioactivity in your hand and put it right in, in, the, uh, in the target. To improve um, radiation protective protection, one developed what they called manual afterloading. And that uh, consisted in first insertion of inactive catheters, um, and then into these, into these uh, inactive catheters, um, one applied the radioactive sources. So you had plenty of time to uh, perform the, to, to cover the, um, the target with the, with the catheters, and then in a quick uh, step, you would, you would insert the sources and would reduce the rate, the, um, the dose, um, to the uh, to the physician mainly to the to the people who are performing the application. That's the old way it was done. Today, one works with remote uh, controlled afterloaders, and this here is a, a, a schematic of of, of, a, of a modern afterloader um, as uh, as it is used today. They are remote controlled, and they work by the following principle: your source. You can see it down. Here on, in the uh, down here, is mounted or welded to a cable to a long cable. Um, source is very small. You can see the size of, of, of a source here next to a match. <coughs> and to operate this machine, the cable is inserted in this machine and is it is rolled on a drum here. It's just rolled up on on a drum. So by rolling it up, you pull the source into the machine. Then it it uh, has an end position or a, a uh, um, an idle position here in a um, in a safe. This is the tungsten or, or lead safe in which the source sits, so that when you are standing next to the machine and the source is in there, you hardly have any uh, any dose rate, and you can uh, you can work safely with it with full radiation protection. And now to uh, to move the source or to to radiate the patient, what you do is you place an applicator in the patient, the way we did it before. Um, you connect the patient and his applicator by a transfer tube to the machine. And then uh, when this is all connected, you roll this, the, the source off the drum. And what happens is the cable pushes uh, the source out through a system of tubes in here, and it pushes it up uh, to a switch, to an indexer, to a switch uh, position where you can serve different channels and put have different uh, a number of different uh, transfer tubes on there for different uh, applicator channels. <clears throat> it can switch between those, and then you just keep moving it out until it is at the um, desired position in the patient. And all of this is done with a stepping motor, so you know exactly the position of the source, where it is, how far it has moved from its starting position. <clears throat> and as a safety, the, the machine has, also has something second. It has a second dummy source in here without radioactivity, and with this dummy source, before every source outride of the um, of the machine, before any every time this before every time before the source is moved out, the machine will first move out the dummy source and check that everything is connected correctly, that there are no kinks in the catheters, and that the source can safely find its uh, position in the patient. And only after that has happened, it will uh, allow uh, radiation with the real source. So that's how the afterloaders work, and that is also that are also the main safety. Um, features of such an afterloading machine. This here is just another schematic, shows you a little bit the mechanism, you can look at that later. And this here is what modern afterloading devices look like today. So 
Uh, brachytherapy, we said, uh, is, gets its name from being at the short distance from the source to the target. <clears throat> now, in brachytherapy, we have different um, types of uh, what we call treating modalities. Um, we have what you, you call contact uh, therapy, in which the source is outside the target, but lies on, on the surface of the target. And you have interstitial therapy, <clears throat> where the... Um, source is, uh, is placed inside the tissue of the target. And now within contact therapy, we have intercavitary therapy. I'll show you some images of that, which is in the, well, well the, cave, the, the intercavitary is, is normally within the uh, female uh, vagina and, and cervix. That's all gynecological therapy. We have interluminal therapy. We have superficial applications like skin molds. And a therapy that is outdated, uh, uh, meanwhile, is endovascular therapy, where one treated inside uh, blood vessels. In interstitial therapy, we use catheters and needers, needles, and um, we also have uh, permanent implants with seeds. And I've, in the next slides, I'll show you a few examples of what this is. <coughs> this here is the Base, or the, the classical uh, uh, intercatheter therapy. It is the treatment of the cancer of the cervix with an, an applicator down here. You call this the Fletcher applicator. This is what they look like in, in reality. And what you see here is the, uh, I'll go back once, one. And what you see here <coughs> is that we have an applicator in which uh, one uh, channel is entered into, or into the cervix. What you see here is, the, is a anatomical uh, section through the female pelvis. And in the pelvis, you see here, down here is the backbone. This here um, is the uterus. Um, this here would be the cervix, the entrance. This is the vagina. And up here somewhere is, up here is the bladder. And down here, this structure is the rectum. <clears throat> okay, so to treat uh, cervical cancer, what, what one did is one placed an applicator with one channel going into the uterus and two more channels sitting in front of the cervix so that you could treat, especially this area down here, with a larger dose distribution and treat the rest of the uterus with a somewhat more slim dose, dose distribution. And that gives you a very typical pear shape. Up here in this blow up, you can see a little bit what the dose distribution looks like. These are the applicators, again, a Fletcher, or an alternative to that is a ring. and. Uh, ring and tandem applicator, where you where the um, the two ovoids here are uh, replaced by a ring, where you have a few more dwell positions that you can load. Okay, this is the classical therapy. <clears throat> this is what um, a therapy like that would look like on a CT, and here you can see the pear-shaped dose distribution, and something here that you see that we will uh, look into into a uh, little bit more detail in later lectures. <clears throat> is that the dose, the dose volume histograms, these are cu cumulative dose volume histograms down here, look different for brachytherapy. That's one of the other differences. <clears throat> and uh, the main difference is that you cannot avoid having the, these long uh, tails to high doses down here. These are the, the high dose regions close to the sources that I showed you on the, uh, on the first CT slide. Okay, so that's about what we're talking about with intracavitary therapy. This slide, our cervical um, uh, uh, cancer is probably the key um, application of brachytherapy in most countries in the world, certainly in all of the countries with lower incomes, where um, operation is not quite as easily available for all the, uh, all the patients. In um, richer industrial countries, um, uh, the treatment of cervical cancer is not that common or that frequent anymore because many of the patients uh, have been found by screening uh, and um, um, and uh, they are operated so that they no longer le need brachytherapy. But I believe in uh, in Asian countries and many of the South Asian countries, um, so, uh, uh, brachytherapy of, of treatment cancer is still one uh, is still the prime um, treatment for brachytherapy. In the industrial countries, this here is the, uh, the, the most frequent treatment. The treatment of the, uh, of the vaginal um, 
uh, a vaginal wall, vaginal tissues, and the vaginal cuff. And what is untypical here is that these patients will typically not have a uterus anymore because it's been surgically removed. And you normally also don't use any needles. But what you have here is a uh, vaginal cylinder which fits in the vagina and spreads the vaginal tissue smoothly on, um, on, on, on top of the applicator so that you have a, um, <clears throat> a very constant equal uh, depth of the, of the vaginal tissue to, uh, to the um, or vagina, very uh, constant uh, distance of the, of, the, um, uh, of the vaginal tissue from the sources, which run in the middle of the cylinder here and can get a homogeneous dose distribution. <laughs> this is used also for patients with uh, cancers of the, of the cervix and the uterus, uh, which still have a, uh, um, uh, a probability of recurrence um, of remaining um, uh, tumor cells in the vaginal tissues. This is what this would look like on CT. So you can see it's a very simple dose distribution here on top that runs uh, smoothly parallel to the vaginal cylinder. And this is what the, uh, the applicator looks like. Um, and the luminal therapy puts the source into the lumen of some kind of a hollow organ, which in this case could be the esophagus. And uh, if we have a tumor here in the esophagus, we could treat that by, for instance, um, inserting a feeding tube into the patient and then putting a brachytherapy uh, catheter into the, um, um, into the feeding tube. And then we would move the source down here and irradiate this tumor right from, uh, from, uh, from the region um, here in the tube. This here is a more advanced type of endoluminal therapy. It's treatment of uh, in, in the endobronchial uh, treatment, treatment inside the bronchus, so you can treat inside the lung, and you can get you can treat uh, lung tumors that are close to one of the bronchi uh, by placing a source inside here. <coughs> interstitial therapy. In interstitial therapy, we don't have a um, Natural, uh, in, uh, uh, natural hole, natural in, in uh, um, a natural place that we can put the sources in the patient, but we have to place, we have to go into the tissue by play, putting needles in there. And typical applications for that are uh, treatments of breast cancer with interstitial breast uh, um, implants, or here what you see is a head and neck implant. To the floor of the mouth. This here is also a, this here is an anatomical section through the through the skull again, and this here is the uh, the um, the lower jaw, and uh, this here is the mobile tongue. This would be the parotid, and, and so on. So, this are these would be two uh, um, examples of interstitial therapy, or one of the important interstitial uh, interstitial therapies today <coughs> is uh, the therapy of the prostate with which you place needles in the prostate. The prostate is down here, this organ down here, with the ureter running through it, ladder. And um, you can do this either by connecting the, uh, um, these needles to an afterloading machine and doing a high dose rate afterloading, or you can insert seeds through the same needles, through these needles, and leave them in the prostate, and that gives you a permanent implant. And that is shown on, on uh, this image here. This here is a distribution of seeds sitting in, in, the, uh, uh, in the prostate. And this is what the dose distribution looks like. And you can nicely shape these dose distributions so that here, this would be the ureter. The uh, ureter, the dose around the ureter is lowered so that you are below the tolerance. So that would be some, app uh, some applications of brachytherapy. That is about the range of things that one does. You can invent quite a few more for any, any uh, region that you need um, a, um, a compact dose distribution and any region that you, can, um, that you can access by a needle. That is probably one of the, uh, one of the main restrictions. Okay, brachytherapy sources. What kind of sources do we use? Dr. Hensley? Hello, was that a question? I have a message to our participants. Can I? Um, 
Well, okay. Let's see. I'll have to, where, where do I find that? Okay. Everybody requested, uh, please mute your microphone. And if you have any question, please type in the chat box. Dr. Hensley, you have uh, 40 minutes left. Um, mm -hmm. So continue. Thank okay. You. Okay. So I need to hurry up a little bit. Maybe I'll have to continue with part of the lecture tomorrow. Um, the most frequently used source today is Iridium-192 um, uh, with a half-life of uh, 30, 74 days and a mean energy of something like 380 keV, but it's a spectrum from about 136 to over 1 MeV uh, of different energies, and it is mainly used in, uh, in afterloading machines today. Um, a second... Uh, um, uh, a second radionuclide that is used uh, today is cobalt-60, and its main difference is that it has a much longer half-life of five and a five and a quarter year. That means you, this source, the iridium source, you have to exchange um, every four, three or four months, and this cobalt source, you only have to exchange every five years. So this, of course, is a big advantage. The um, trade-off is that uh, cobalt has a higher um, energy of 1.25 MeV, which means you need more radiation protection to, to use cobalt source. And these other sources here are either outdated, like radium-226, that was, uh, was what it all started with, or cesium-137, which is not used because the sources are simply too large. <coughs> um, and uh, for seeds, it's mainly these sources down here, iodine-125 and palladium-103. Um, there are a few new radionuclides uh, that are being introduced into, into therapy now or that are being, research is, is being done. And one of the uh, important, uh, um, um, uh, of the important uh, uh, isotopes is iterbium-169. So there are also some, some uh, research on, on thulium-170. And the main reason for that is that it has lower um, photon energies. So you need less shielding. And the idea is that one could would like to have um, uh, afterloading or brachytherapy procedures where you need almost no radiation protection. Another reason is that you can also more effectively um, produce shieldings inside the applicators. But OK, that, that later. But um, this is experimental, and it, it is nothing that is going to come very quick. And the main reason why this is uh, something that is questionable whether it will ever be used very much is that um, our dose calculation as we use it today with with what we call the TG43 formalism uh, is not useful for these low energy uh, isotopes and this is something I want to show you in the lecture tomorrow. Okay, um, there are a few beta emitting sources, there'll be another table with that. Uh, yes, here are the beta emitting sources that are used. These, these sources that I've shown before are all photon, what, what we call photon emitting sources. <clears throat> we use the photons from the radioactive decay uh, from, these, um, from these isotopes. Maybe a step back. All of these sources are actually beta, um, uh, um, or decay by beta uh, decay. But we use the, the photons uh, from... Um, daughter uh, isotopes which are produced in the decay scheme. And there are a few with which we use the, actually use the primary uh, betas, and this is today mainly ruthenium-106, which is used in eye applicators. It has quite a high beta energy of 1.7 MeV, so you can get down to about um, 15 millimeters depth, and it has a nice long uh, half-life of 300 of, of a year. And other... Um, um, so, uh, beta sources that are used today are strontium-90 and phosphorus-32. <clears throat> so these are the sources that we normally deal with today. Brachytherapy sources are all sealed sources. Brachytherapy always works with sealed sources. Open radioactivity is never used in brachytherapy, where medicine uses 
open radi uh, non-sealed radioactivity, that's nuclear medicine. That's a completely different um, uh, uh, mechanism that is used there. In brachytherapy, we always used use um, sealed sources. So what we have is source material inside some kind of a, an encapsulation here, and the encapsulation prevents uh, the, uh, the radioactive material from getting contact uh, with the patient or with, uh, um, with the environment and causing contamination. That's why we do that. Okay, and then you have different names for these small uh, radioactive uh, sources, sometimes called tubes. If they have a point, you call them a needle. If they're very thin, it's a wire. Uh, there are some, I think you can still actually purchase uh, uh, iridium wires from a roll, and there are machines with which you can cut the sources uh, and, uh, and uh, close the encapsulation. And then if you have something very small, it's a seed. So this is just nomenclature, just for names. This is what the uh, sources look like. Technically, these over here are the are afterloader sources. You all, the source is always connected to a wire. It's in an encapsulation, which is typically a stainless steel encapsulation. Or maybe uh, to be used in MR, uh, it, it, could be, um, it could be titanium or something. And inside the uh, encapsulation, you have a wire with the, with the isotopes used today. It's, it's normally a wire, a solid wire of iridium or cobalt. Like here, this is a long source used in high dose rate after loading. And this is a small, short source. It is used in so-called pulse dose uh, um, after loaders. Okay, so they're all, all very much the, very similar. Most of them look like this source up here. Where we have a large variety of, of designs is in seeds. Um, this seed up here, in this seed, the, um, um, the, the radioactive material, the iodine-125, is absorbed on a, resin, on a, on a sphere of, uh, of resin, little balls in here. Down here, it's, uh, it's absorbed on a silver rod in this, uh, in, in this source. And this source down here, it's not uh, uh, iodine. This is a palladium source. <clears throat> but here you have um, a graphite pellet that is uh, on which the, um, uh, the, the palladium is absorbed. And you ha also have a lead marker. So these look very different. And that also uh, has large influence on the dose distribution. So you need to... Uh, you need to look what the uh, source looks like and select mainly the correct um, dosimetric data for these sources. They are quite different. <clears throat> so, how do we select what kind of a uh, what kind of a, a, a source until we use? And the uh, the main selection criteria, well, are first all of the radioisotopes that we use in brachytherapy are artificial. Uh, radioactive uh, materials, radioactive materials, and they are produced in nuclear reactors, so we shouldn't shut all of them down, except radium-226, which is a, a natural uh, isotope. But all the others are uh, produced in nuclear reactors by neutron capture reactions. So you put them in there, irradiate them with neutrons, and the neutrons are captured by the, uh, by the, uh, by, by the material, and um, eventually you get the radioactive uh, isotope that you are looking for. The criteria with which we select which isotopes are useful are the specific activity, which is the activity per mass unit or per mass of the, uh, of the material. A high specific activity means that we get a lot of, uh, of radioactive radioactivity in a small volume, which means we can produce a small source with a high dose rate uh, um, in, in a very small volume. So we, we can make the sources small, we can make the applicators small, and this is, um, this is necessary to make it acceptable for the patients. You don't want to have, uh, want to make, produce large holes in the patient to get the source in. Second criteria is the photon energy. Photon energy determines the treatment range, more or less, but the important thing that it determines is what we call the air camera rate constant. That's this quantity over here. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, the air camera rate constant 
is a number which tells us how much dose rate do we get from a source. And other criteria are the production rate, how long do we need to leave this, um, uh, the material in the, in, the, in the reactor so that uh, the isotope builds up. That's simply money. The longer we leave it in there, uh, the, the more expensive it is. Criteria are the uh, radiochemical preparation. You always need to clean the uh, sources and, and uh, extract the, the pure uh, radioisotope and have no other radioactivity in there, which would have different half-lives and, and things you can't control. And also some application criteria, like the half-life, how long can we use the source? <laughs> Uh, what kind of, what, how long are the treatment times? Are they too short? Are they too long? And things like that. So these are the criteria with which we select sources. And then iridium turns out to be one of the best that we can get. And cobalt is almost as good as iridium. Okay, now we want to go more in, in, into the physics of the thing. We, and we want to look at when we have a radioactive source emitting a radi radiation, <clears throat> how do we, how does this produce uh, dose um, in tissue, in matter. And the quantity of what we want, that we uh, need to describe this is the kerma, the kinetic energy released in matter. That is, kerma is the kinetic energy of the interactive particles. The ki their kinetic energy, so we have a photon of 1.25 MeV, and eventually it will deposit 1.25 MeV uh, in, the, um, uh, in the matter. But now we are looking at only at partic par uh, particles from the primary radiation coming from the source and not the scatter radiation from the surrounding material. So we are looking only at this, uh, at a, at a, spe a specific uh, volume, a specific, uh, um, uh, a specific mass unit um, that is being radiated and that is receiving the material. If we speak about dose, we include the energy from the scattered radiation. So this is something more realistic. This is what the patient sees. The radiation interacts with a, with, with a larger area in the patient, and the patient gets those from the primary radiation and from the side. But in Kerma, we don't look at all the scattered radiation. We only look at the radiation coming from the, prim, from the primary radiation out of the source. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so the amount of, uh, of, the, of the Kerma that is deposited we can also look at what that depends on. It depends on the activity of the source. That means the number of, the, of emitted particles. And it depends on the energy of the emitted radiation. The energy of the emitted radiation for iridium, for instance, looks like this. It's a spectrum of radiation which reaches, uh, ranges from something like 10 MeV to over one M, uh, 10 keV to over 1 MeV and has a mean energy of 350 KeV. And what you see here is the spectrum of iridium at the surface of the source, or actually the, this is the primary spectrum, which is a line spectrum. And then the spectrum becomes broader and changes with depth and matter. And now, question to you, I'll come back and, and answer this question uh, in, a, in a few seconds. Um, why does this spectrum change? Think about that a minute. I'll give you the answer in a, in, in a few seconds. Okay, um, so it's dependent on the number of photons, on the energy of the photons, and the probability that the radiation will interact with the material. That is, on the probability or the number of interactions per decay, per, uh, um, uh, for, per entering photons. So with this, we can describe the kerma. Um, this slide here shows the dependence of kerma or dose on the energy of the material um, and also on the atomic charge on the, on the type of material. And what you see here is the interaction probability for different interaction processes like photoelectric absorption and Compton scattering. Photoelectric uh, absorption is, um, yeah, it's given by this cross-section tau, Compton scattering is given by the, the interaction probability is the, um, is the uh, uh, cross-section sigma. And here in these, um, uh, in these diagrams, you can see the red line is the dependence of 
um, photoelectric absorption for of tau in carbon and up here in lead, so two different materials. <laughs> and the brown lines are the interaction probabilities for Compton scattering. And this was down here was in carbon and here in lead. <laughs> so these um, diagrams show you the interaction probabilities. And well, what you what I want one thing I want to show you is that the sum of all of these interaction probabilities is what we call the energy transfer coefficient mu. The energy co uh, transfer coefficients that you find that, that that you use in your dose calculations very frequently. That's simply the sum of these of the, of the um, of the interaction probabilities of different processes. And the sum line here is the green line in here, which is simply the lines under it summed up. So this shows you that you have an energy dependence of the uh, um, of the processes of the interaction processes and a um, material uh, dependence. And as you can see, the energy dependence for um, for photoelectric absorption is very steep, both in carbon and in lead. The Compton interaction probability is this round line here, and in the in the area we're looking at, from 10 to kV to about 1 MeV, it doesn't change much. It doesn't change much ne neither for carbon nor for lead, and it stays at the about, about the same place. So for Compton scattering, we have almost no energy dependence, and we have almost no dependence on the atomic charge. While for photoelectric absorption, we have a strong atomic charge dependence with the atomic number to the third uh, potential and the, uh, and the dependence on energy with one over the third potential of energy. So we have a strong energy dependence. Okay. Um, now for um, <clears throat> iridium, we're in the energy range of, I said around between 10 and um, uh, 10 kV and, and an MeV, and the mean energy is something like 350 kV, that's around here. So what you can see here is that um, the main process is Compton scattering, this brown line. Photoelectric scattering is much smaller. Photoelectric scattering becomes larger when you go to low energies below something like 10 kV or actually starts becoming stronger below 100 kV. So that means uh, for iridium, our main process, interaction process that we are looking at is Compton scattering. Okay, and now we can go back to, uh, to the previous slide and answer that qu uh, qu uh, question. Why does this spectrum change here? Well, what we see is that we are have an increase of scatter radiation out here at, this is pretty far away, this is something like five centimeters from the source, but here we have a large amount of, of scatter radiation coming from, the, from Compton scattering. So the spectrum changes with depth. We get more and more scatter, which is more and more low energy uh, photons uh, in, with depth in the, in the tissues. Okay, so, and for this reason, we, um, we distinguish between different types, different classes of, uh, of brachytherapy sources, and we have high energy sources with a mean primary energy. That's that's the energy, the mean energy at the uh, at the um, at the surface of the source. Mean primary energy larger than 150 kV. So iridium is part, is, is one of those, and uh, uh, cobalt uh, is also one. And low energy sources, that's like um, iodine 125 with uh, 20, 28 kV or palladium. Um, they have primary energies lower than 50 kV. They are low energy sources. And for these low energy sources, our main uh, interaction process is photoelectric scattering. For high energy sources, it's um, Compton scattering. Then we also have these medium energy sources. That would be the ytterbium that I showed you where the primary energy is somewhere between 50 and 150 kV. And the problem with these sources is that we are, have a, a mix of uh, photoelectric um, uh, uh, absorption and Compton scattering, which changes, 
changing with depth. And that makes uh, the, uh, the dose calculation difficult to describe. It's not, as, not near as easy. So that, and that is also a reason why these medium energy sources are not really ready for use yet. You, we need better calculation uh, algorithms to use them. Okay, now back uh, to towards those uh, calculation. Um, we we have a radio uh, a radioactive source, and from the radio with the radiation from, or for the radiation from the source, we want to calculate the dose that is distributed to a patient. So we need to know how strong is the source, how much activity is coming out. And what you normally um, uh, uh, learn is that you specify activity by the activity in, in Becquerel or something like that. But that is not what we use in brachytherapy. In brachytherapy, we specify the source by the air camera rate, which is equivalent to the, uh, uh, to the activity of the source. The air camera rate, which is the kerma in an air volume, in which the air and the source are surrounded by vacuum, so there's no scatter uh, coming from the outside. And there the kerma is the sum of all of the uh, energy uh, of the radiation quanta, which are entering this, uh, this volume of material and then interacting um, in, uh, the, uh, in the material and losing, losing some energy in the volume. And the sum of this energy will be our kerma. And this, is, this is the quantity that we uh, eventually want to, uh, want to calculate. And this is also by what we specify the, uh, the source. And those for this uh, for this purpose would be an impractical uh, impractical quantity because those always depends on the material around scattering something in, and this is something that is not easily to reproducibly define uh, for um, uh, for a basic um, uh, for a basic description of, of a source. Okay, now the quantity that we use to uh, to uh, to uh, to connect between the activity of the source, the activity that decays and becomes less with, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with the lifetime of the source, uh, the, um, to, to, um, to, to connect between the activity and the air camera rate, that's this uh, number here, is the air camera rate constant. And it is defined simply like this here. This is the definition from ICRU 85. Um, it is simply the activity, or uh, well, it would be the um, air come rate divided by the activity. That's that is our um, uh, our air camera rate constant. <clears throat> and what I want to show you next is that we can calculate this um, this uh, um, air camera rate constant from physical problems, uh, uh, pro uh, physical principles, using this equation here. And you don't never you actually don't need to do this in the in the hospital, but I think it's it's important to understand what all defines um, the uh, interaction here. So we'll do that in the next step. So we we want to calculate the air camera rate constant here by the this equation here and by the properties shown in these diagrams. So first we need to. Um, make a summation of the em energy that is emitted by the source, as you see here in the spectrum. And we need to multiply um, uh, the number of, of uh, uh, photons by the probability that they interact in air. So we will use uh, the, the information from, dia from, from diagrams like this here for air. And that gives us, well, this sum here. It's my mouse here. The sum here, the number of uh, number of photons multiply uh, multi uh, um, multiplied by the energy multiplied by the interaction probability by the uh, um, mass transition coefficients. Okay, so in this uh, in this equation, we have the mass transition coefficients. We have the photon energy for each line of the spectrum. We have the number of photons. Uh, which have the energy EI per TK. And um, we, also, we need to normalize this by the solid angle because we're only looking at one point and the source uh, um, 
emits its radiation into the into all in, into all directions in space, and that all adds up to a solid angle of four pi. So we divide by four pi. <clears throat> and what we also do for technical reasons here is we have an energy cutoff. That is, we don't um, we do not um, um, we exclude low energy photons lower than something like 5 or 10 keV. And these are photons which normally don't um, uh, reach the patient, which are also not included in the air camera rate that we, that we would measure because they are already absorbed in the encapsulation of the source. So they don't co contribute. So this gives us this equation up here. So we need, it's, it, it depends on all of these different quantities that we just looked at. Um, the air camera rate constants. Yes. yes. Sorry if I disturb you. Actually, we have a time constriction. Uh, so please try to uh, complete your slide uh, as soon as possible. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll quit in, in two or three slides. Um, something we need to keep in mind is that such an air cons uh, camera rate constant is valid for only one type of source, which means one technical design of source. So uh, the uh, air camera rate constant for a, say, a, um, uh, a variant source is different than the air ca uh, camera rate constant for a nucleotron source or variant or electa or, or baby or whatever you have. <laughs> um, different types which means either different isotopes, but even with the same isotopes, different technical designs uh, have different values. Um, so they can be easily confused. There are also can be confusion with other numbers that you find in textbooks, like the dose rate constant gamma. You find this in old uh, physics textbooks. This is a, a quantity that was used to uh, describe the dose coming from an isotope any kind of isotope, and it's valid for a point source of the isotope. So this is just something that you can use for a rough estimate of what kind of a dose rate are you going to get from a certain activity of a radioactive material. And this is something that you, for instance, use in radiation protection. But it's different from the values that we need in dose um, calculation. So again, air camera rate constant is valid for one type of source. Um, the Air camera rate constant that we are looking to is connected, well, to the activity of the source, and then we have different uh, types of activity. We want to speak of the contained activity, that is the chemical amount of, um, of the number of atoms of, of this radioisotope in the source. Um, this would be this air camera rate constant gamma delta. That is actually not what we use uh, for, for dose calculation. What we use is um, this um, air camera rate um, uh, constants down here, the gamma AKR, or it's called gamma uh, gamma K by the uh, IAEA, and this is connected to what we call the apparent activity of the source, <clears throat> and the apparent activity is lower than the uh, than the contained activity, lower than the number of of, of decays that are actually happening, because. Uh, a lot of the radioactivity is absorbed in the encapsulation. We also, we've already uh, considered that with delta, but part of it is, a lot of it is also, um, um, is also uh, absorbed in the radioactivity, radioactive material itself. Radioactive, radioactive materials are heavy materials. Iridium has a, uh, has a Z of 192, um, uh, no, uh, a mass of 192, uh, which uh, so it's it's a heavy material that absorbs a lot of its radiation by itself. So we what we see is less, and what we want to have is a number that describes the uh, the true camera air camera rate that we would measure outside the source. And so it's this um, uh, air camera rate constant that we actually use. So. Maybe I believe this is this. We can we can probably stop with this uh, with this uh, slide here for dose calculation. For in, for instance, in the treatment planning system, the source activity is specified by the reference air camera rate at one meter distance, or in TG forty three, which we will speak about tomorrow. Uh, we have a different number, which is simply the air camera rate divided by 
uh, the inverse square law, so that this number is valid at any distance, the source strength SK. And it's not uh, specified by the activity or described by the activity. We don't use that in the calculations. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that if we would use the activity, we would also ha always have to multiply with an air camera rate. And in the air camera rate, uh, with an air camera rate uh, constant, and in the air camera rate constant, we, with the air camera rate constant, we would always introduce additional uncertainty because there is uncertainty in all of the steps to, uh, to, to determine uh, gamma, this, this, this number gamma. So we don't use the activity. We directly use the air camera rate. And this is something that can be measured. And that is the way sources are actually calibrated by measuring the air camera rate. And that will be the... Um, uh, the content of the of the next slides that I will show you tomorrow, Reiki uh, therapy source calibration. So I think we can round up with that for today. And well, maybe you have some questions. Thank you very much for your attention so far. Thank you, sir, for your uh, very knowledgeable and informative talk. We are very happy to have you our faculty speaker. Uh, we have received uh, some questions. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll have to look at so the chat My first here. question from Deepak Kumar. Is there mm -hmm. any dosimetric advantage of cobalt 16 over iridium 192 as it is extensively being used nowadays despite having low specific activity? Um, well, the, the advantage of cobalt 60 is the long half life. You only need to buy the source every something like five years, <clears throat> and that is something you can. There's quite a bit of uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion about. Can you actually use a source that long? Is it safe? Um, and actually, what one finds is that the sources are produced now so that they are safe, and you can actually use them for five years. They the, the machines always have uh, some kind of a limitation, so that after, I believe, one hundred thousand source drives. Um, uh, this, uh, the machine will, will no longer allow uh, to use the source for treatment, but uh, they are safe for 100,000 uh, source drives. So that's okay. That, that, that concerns the main difference. The, the concern that a lot of people have is, are the dose distributions the same? And what you see, what, we've, uh, uh, what I can actually show a little bit tomorrow also in, in, in the lecture, is that the dose distributions are almost identical. <laughs> and the reason... Um, is that both of these, um, both iridium and um, um, cobalt are high energy sources in which um, almost only um, uh, the, the Compton effect is dominant. And the Compton effect doesn't have much energy dependence. And the, and the, and the consequence is that the dose distributions look very similar. The difference is mainly in radiation protection um, for a cobalt source with high energy, you need thicker walls uh, of, uh, for in, in your bunker than you would need for a um, uh, for an iridium source. Otherwise, uh, um, they are uh, cobalt and iridium are almost identical. Okay, I think Deepak Kumar get his answer. Um, now, second one from Golasomia. How can extra be used in the red therapeutic application from treating cancer in brachytherapy, irrespective of using radio isotopes? It's not very use, not very often used uh, um, X-rays for 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 real brachytherapy. <laughs> the main problem is you have to get a your your uh, X-ray source inside the patient, inside the tissue. And there are some machines now who do something like that, but uh, they are typically larger than um, uh, than, than the uh, radioactive sources that you can use. Um, they're actually and, and talking of X-ray uh, X-ray sources, there are two uh, let's say classes of, of X-ray sources. One is what the you may know the the Zeiss interbeam system, which has a um, um, an X-ray source that is a long, small needle that you can put inside, inside an applicator and also inside a patient, 
Um, and you would have something like brachytherapy with with the uh, with this um, uh, with this intrabeam. Uh, the second uh, method is is the um, uh, is the radioactive sources by called Zoft, uh, which is really a small radioactive source, um, not much larger than. Uh, than a, than a brachytherapy source that you can put in a catheter that you can radiate. <laughs> but both of these techniques need catheters th that are that cannot be near as flexible, can't go around curves as much as uh, as, a, as a brachytherapy source can. So they so they are technically very restricted. You can use them only on, on very few cases. So it's simply it's 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 technically not practical to use uh, the X-rays uh, for for the typical applications that you have in brachytherapy. The intrabeam you can probably use, and also the, you possibly can use the, um, both the intrabeam and the, and the, and the, and, and the soft micro uh, x-ray sources for gynecological tumors. Um, they have, I believe also soft has, has applicators and things like that that look like a, like the, like a cervix applicator in which you can, uh, um, which you can place them. You can do that, but, um, depending on, well, it depends on your budget actually, because the, um, well, the interbeams, uh, the, the, the interbeam is, uh, is very rigid. You can only use it for a few applications for very, much less than you could use uh, any other kind of source. You could, you could use the soft for maybe more applications, but uh, um, the soft, uh, the soft um, uh, radiators um, have only a very uh, limited uh, lifetime. You can only use them for, I don't know, I believe it's less than, 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 than 20 uh, uh, patient radiations, and then you have to replace the source, and you have to go through a large, uh, uh, go through the commissioning and the and the quality assurance and all kinds of things like that. So it's laborious, it's expensive. These things, these sources are expensive, and they're not very stable. So I would also say this is something more experimental. It's not really practical for for um, for large scale uses. It is really very informative. Thank you so much, sir, for your inspiring work. Now, I take this opportunity to thank our speaker, Dr. Frank Hensley, for sparing his valuable time and knowledge with us. Thanks to all the participants for their interest in the program. Okay, thank you all for listening. I'd also like to thank Dr. Golam Abu Jakaria and the entire team of SCMPCR whose tireless efforts have made this platform functional for us. Thank you, everyone, once again. We appreciate your presence here. We will see you next time. Our next lecture is on 6 February 2021 on source, calibration, verification, and dose measurement. Thank you all once again, and see you tomorrow. Yes, Stay see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's see, I'll stay on online. Is there anything that we need to speak about as organizers for tomorrow or is everything set? Uh, I think everything is okay. Uh, okay. Frank, yeah, Frank. Okay, so then. The, time, the technics is also functioning very well. And we have more than 55 participants in this course. Yeah, looks pretty good. I hope, I hope we will receive more participants tomorrow. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your interesting talk, especially many, many physics for physician, for the physicist. Yes, the physicists know the background of physics. Yes, and, uh, I think that's, that's important. It's, it's important. Mm -hmm. important. Yeah, thank you. Okay, see you tomorrow. So see you tomorrow, yeah? Let's all have an evening tea now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good night. Good night. <clears throat> thank you all the participants and thank you, uh, Professor Frank Hensley. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.